Hello everyone, welcome back to the Nuclear Criticality Safety Lecture Series. Previously we discussed the theory behind the eigenvalue sensitivity coefficient analysis, and we reviewed several methods and several codes for estimating these sensitivity coefficients. But just like the dog chasing after a car, what do we do with these sensitivity coefficients once we've caught them? The sandwich equation allows us to use sensitivity coefficients to estimate the nuclear data-induced uncertainty in responses that are estimated by modeling and simulation codes. In criticality safety, these responses tend to be eigenvalue estimates, and the codes that compute these estimates tend to be continuous energy Monte Carlo codes. The sandwich equation takes a vector of sensitivity coefficients for some system response and combines it with the cross-section covariance data for each piece of nuclear data used in that simulation. Next, it combines this again with the transpose of the system sensitivity coefficients to estimate the amount of nuclear data-induced uncertainty in that system's response. This matrix math might seem complicated, but it's easier to follow if you consider the units of each term in this expression. When you do that, you see that the d sigma over sigma term in the sensitivity coefficients cancels out with the delta sigma over sigma uncertainty from the covariance matrix, leaving us with only delta r over r for our response. Again, we must use the cross-section covariance data in this expression instead of just multiplying the sensitivity coefficients by each cross-section's uncertainty because the cross-section uncertainty is actually represented by a 2D covariance matrix of correlated uncertainties. The sensitivity coefficients that go into the sandwich equation must be finally resolved and reasonably converged, which is why we cannot reliably use direct perturbation methods to prepare sensitivity coefficients for nuclear criticality safety analyses. This covariance data is offered for each and every isotope and for each and every reaction, and some covariance data uses as many as 252 energy groups for their uncertainties. It's just not feasible to compute reliable, reasonably converged sensitivity coefficients for a system with that many uncertain parameters. The sandwich equation allows us to do some fairly amazing statistical analyses. First, if there is a difference between the Monte Carlo simulation's calculated k-effective and the benchmark experiment's measured k-effective, then knowing the magnitude of the nuclear data-induced uncertainty for k-effective tells us if this difference is statistically significant. In general, an eigenvalue bias that's more than two or three standard deviations away from zero is statistically significant and is cause for concern. Usually sites will perform validation studies on a series of benchmark experiments whenever each new end of data library is released to see if that library made the simulation significantly more or significantly less accurate for that benchmark experiment series. If you're comparing the eigenvalue bias for multiple simulations like this, then a chi-squared statistical test can tell us if the average difference between k-calculated and k-experimental is significant compared to the average uncertainty in k-effective for that series of benchmark experiments. This nuclear data uncertainty propagation technique can do even more amazing things. Perhaps most amazingly is its ability to identify benchmark experiments that are neutronically similar to some target application. Imagine that we're trying to identify the ideal, perfect benchmark experiment for predicting the computational bias in some application. What traits do we want this perfect benchmark to have? Because our goal is to use this benchmark to predict the computational bias in our application, we want to ensure that any sources of bias in the application are also reflected and are present in our similar benchmark experiments. If we recall the fundamental theorem of Tsunami, Tsunami postulates that code biases are primarily driven by errors or uncertainty in nuclear data. Because we want our benchmark to cover the same sources of computational bias as our application, and because these biases are driven primarily by uncertainty in nuclear data, then it makes sense that the ideal benchmark should share the same sources of nuclear data-induced uncertainty as the application. So how can we identify how much nuclear data-induced uncertainty is shared between some benchmark and some application? If we know the sensitivity coefficients for one system, whose eigenvalue is k1, and we put it into the sandwich equation with the sensitivity coefficients for the other system, k2, then the sandwich equation will yield the shared uncertainty between k1 and k2. 
If we take the shared uncertainty divided by the standard deviations for K1 and K2, then we can transform the shared uncertainty into the equivalent of a Pearson's correlation coefficient, which now describes the fraction of the nuclear data-induced uncertainty that is shared between K1 and K2. If systems have more materials in common and are sensitive to cross-section uncertainty at the same neutron energies, then they will have higher C sub K similarity coefficients. In contrast, a uranium fueled system is not likely to be similar to a plutonium system, nor is a fast system likely to share the same sources of uncertainty as a thermal spectrum system. If the C sub K equals 1 for two systems, then those systems share 100% of all nuclear data induced uncertainty. This means that they must contain the same materials, all of the same isotopes, and that they are affected by neutrons at exactly the same energies. In fact, any deviation at all in the materials or neutron spectrum in these two systems will cause C sub K to drop below 1. This means that a C sub K of 1 indicates that the two systems are neutronically identical. In this case, the benchmark is a perfect exact surrogate for the application, and any computational biases present in the benchmark will show their ugly faces in the same exact way in the application. We'll discuss this more in a few minutes, but our goal with sensitivity-based validation is to identify benchmark experiments that have a C sub K between our application and different benchmarks that is as close to one as possible, and then to use the observed computational biases in these highly similar benchmark experiments to predict the computational bias in our application. A C sub K of zero indicates that the systems overall have no shared sources of uncertainty, but zero is actually not the smallest C sub K possible. A C sub K of negative one indicates that the benchmarks are anti-correlated. In other words, for these anti-correlated cases, a piece of uncertain nuclear data that causes a positive bias for one system would cause a negative bias in the other system. In general, few systems have negative C sub Ks, but they do exist. Once we identify a set of highly similar benchmark experiments, the idea is to use C sub Ks as a trending parameter in USL stats, and then to extrapolate the USL stats regression fit to a C sub K of 1, where, if our trend is strong enough, the extrapolated inferred bias should approach the true computational bias for our application. We don't always need to trend on C sub K though, and there are a number of other sensitivity based metrics that we could trend on. The E metric, for example, computes sensitivity coefficients by assuming that the covariance between each cross-section equals 1. In other words, this metric simply computes the overlap of these sensitivity coefficients without weighting them by the uncertainty in the covariance data. Essentially, it computes a dot product for the sensitivity coefficients. Let's close by discussing how many similar systems we need to identify to have confidence in our USL estimates, and how similar do these systems need to be. Studies by Broadhead, Reardon, and Hopper at Oak Ridge suggest that we need at least 20 benchmark experiments with a C sub K of above 0.8 to accurately predict the bias in an application. And ideally, we'd like to have at least 10 cases with a C sub K of above 0.9. The NRC sets the bar even higher than this, recommending at least 10 benchmark experiments with a C sub K of above 0.95. Blind studies have shown that the USL stats trending analysis method does a pretty good job of estimating computational biases if and when we have a significant number of highly similar benchmark experiments. But what happens if we don't? Furthermore, the cross-section covariance data is, like all nuclear data, inaccurate and constantly undergoing revisions and changes. So what happens if our covariance data changes so that instead of having 20 highly similar experiments, we now have only 19 highly similar experiments? This uncomfortable situation isn't just hypothetical. Something just like this happened several years ago when the Oak Ridge National Laboratory released revised and probably more accurate cross-section covariance data. These questions are, unfortunately, still open research questions, 
We'll have to wait and see how code validation guidance changes as we continue to improve our cross-section covariance data. Additionally, some of the other code validation methods that we'll discuss in this course, such as the Whisper and Surfer methods, offer us the ability to either add additional conservatism when we have an insufficient number of highly similar benchmark experiments, or to extract useful information about computational biases from systems that may only be marginally similar to our application. We'll discuss these two methods in the coming lectures, but now let's discuss how to run the scale tsunami IP code, which allows us to estimate both C sub k's for different cases, and to propagate the impact of nuclear data uncertainty using the standard sandwich equation. The tsunami IP code's input is actually fairly simple. Like all scale codes, it starts with an equals the sequence name in the first line, and the working title for the input in the second line. From here, we dive into the calculation parameters for the similarity analysis. The C input parameter tells Tsunami IP to compute C sub k's, and the C long parameter tells Tsunami IP to print out additional info about how different pieces of uncertain nuclear data contribute to the C sub k. Likewise, the uncert parameter tells Tsunami IP to use the standard sandwich equation to estimate the uncertainty in the responses, and the uncert long parameter describes the sources of this uncertainty in more detail. The regular Tsunami 1D, 2D, and 3D codes will also perform the standard sandwich equation calculations by default. And you'll notice that the Tsunami IP output for this information is actually identical to the Tsunami 3D code's uncertainty information output when performing a regular sensitivity coefficient calculation. The values parameter tells Tsunami IP to print out the values for its similarity metrics rather than just computing them and keeping them secret. And so I recommend using the values parameter in each and every Tsunami IP input. To be completely honest, I don't know why the default for Tsunami IP is not to always print out these similarity metrics. Lastly, we can ask Tsunami IP to compute similarity coefficients for other metrics, such as the E metric, and to print the long version of these similarity coefficients if we like. Tsunami IP has many more input parameters and can compute many more versions of these similarity metrics than I have time to discuss today, and I'd recommend reading through the Tsunami IP manual if you're interested in learning more about these other similarity metrics or these other input options. We need to specify the benchmark experiments whose sensitivity coefficients we're giving to Tsunami IP, and then also we need to specify the application cases for which we want Tsunami IP to compute similarity coefficients. This data is entered in the read experiments and read applications data blocks, respectively. When we run Tsunami IP, it will compute the similarity of each benchmark experiment to each of the application cases. So if, for example, we have 20 benchmark experiments and four application cases, then this Tsunami IP calculation will compute and output 80 similarity coefficients. The data entered in these blocks is simply the path to and the name of the .sdf sensitivity data file for each case, which is an output from the sensitivity version of Tsunami that contains all the sensitivity coefficients for that case. One single SDF can be used both as a benchmark experiment and as an application in the Tsunami IP input. It can be used twice. And the similarity of that case to itself will always equal one. When we run the Tsunami IP code, we can open up its text output in Fulcrum and we can scroll down to find the the uncertainty propagation information. Similarity coefficients. The components of the similarity coefficients in the long output.
and any other similarity metrics. Lastly, we can use the secret and very convenient USL stats parameter to have Tsunami IP automatically prepare a USL stats style input, which makes it very easy to prepare a USL stats input using these benchmark cases. If we use this USL stats option, then we can use the EV equals and the UV equals input options in the read experiment block to specify the reference experimental k-effective and its uncertainty for these benchmark experiments. If we examine the USL stats input, we'll see that it now includes a tsunami input option, which tells USL stats that it will be drawing a trend using C sub k values, and that it should extrapolate this trend to a value of C sub k equals 1. This concludes our lecture on similarity assessment and on the tsunami IP code. With this information, you can now use sensitivity coefficients and cross-section covariance data to determine the fraction of nuclear data-induced uncertainty that is shared between two cases. These similarity metrics can not only be used as a go-to trending parameter in USL stats, but as we'll discuss in the next lecture, they can also be used to estimate USLs using the newer WHISPER method.